All right. So, oh, and I forgot. We're going to use these later, so I better get this started up. So as I'm pulling this up, I'll kind of mention this. Um, so a handful of you still have any issues with iClicker. Finally got a hold of someone and figured out um, what the issue is. So I was not aware when I decided to use these this semester that they had added this step. Um, but even if you've registered your iClicker on Canvas, uh, you need to register an iClicker account. So I'll put up a link after class that has some, or sorry, an announcement with some links after class. And I'll kind of walk you through it. But basically, I mean, you could Google search iClicker student account and then there will be kind of you know, the first link. You'll click on like there's a sign in option if you already have one or you can create an account. So once you have that account, what you need to do in order for me to be able to tell on the cloud after I'm using that your number is whatever number it is, is you also have to register your, your remote on your iClicker account. So usually this is under something like if you pull up on a web browser and it's like uh, under your profile, there'll be an option to register remote. So like I said, I'll put some links up there on Canvas that'll kind of walk you through it, but you're gonna need to go on the iClear website, create an account and then register your remote on that account as well as on Canvas, right? Don't know why they can't just identify off of Canvas. I think they're trying to get more users on their iClicker uh, or kind of get iClicker users on there. Um, but that's the only way I can then kind of sync up to Canvas what I'm seeing in class. So if, you know, you're not seeing those grades sync up as non-zeros on Canvas. That's the reason why. So I'll get an additional resource up there. If you want some help after class, even today, I can kind of help you kind of show you on where you'll go, kind of how you'll register and then how you add, kind of register that remote on your profile. Um, but once we get that, everything should be fine. Don't worry about it impacting your grade. I've got everything. If you've been here, it's, I can see it. I just can't see your name associated with it, right? But as soon as you get that, you're kind of, um, your remote registered under your profile, then your name will pop up and we should be good to go. Okay. So if you have questions about that after class, feel free to kind of, I can kind of help walk you through the last, you know, five, 10 minutes after class. Um, otherwise, I'll put that link up on announcement on Canvas. Okay. Any questions for me before you go into what to do at the end of the day today? Yeah, that Excel assignment. Um, what I want you to do, if I think I mentioned this before, if you are typing out some of the answers as responses to that, you can upload both your Excel kind of file as well as a Word document if it's easier for you to type it out. So you can upload multiple documents. You don't have to do multiple submissions. You can just upload kind of multiple documents at once. Okay. Do we just have the Excel? If just type yeah, if you just want to type in Excel, that's fine with me. I don't mind grading it like that. I just know some people will really get annoyed typing Excel and all of a sudden you can't see what you typed and you got to click on the cell again. So I, I get that. But um, yeah, you can upload just the Excel file if you want. Any other questions for you going here? All right. So we left off kind of talking about what you mean, variances, percentiles. Everything was like one variable, right? So today what we're going to do is talk about the relationship between two variables, right? We're talking about a couple statistics that measure the relationship between two variables. And then we'll kind of progress from here to talk, talk about probability. Right? So, you know, what might, might, you know, something we might be interested in is if a variable increases, so call this variable X, what happens to some other variable Y, right? Does it increase as well? Does it decrease or does it not much of anything? This could be something like as the years of education someone takes goes up, what happens to their income? Does it tend to go up, go down, or does it not really have any impact? Okay. So we're going to have two measures, which are the covariance and the correlation, or correlation coefficient. There's another way we'll kind of reference this. Correlation is a little bit shorthand, but that's generally how we talk about it. Um, and really, the correlation is just a scaled version of the covariance. So the original way that we calculate the covariance is probably going to be the trickier part. Once we have the covariance, it's pretty easy to get the correlation. Okay. Does it feel like these are like lights are dimmed, or is it just me? Yeah, no, okay. I just like try to play on. So, anyway, um, just like with anything else, like we talked about the variance, we're going to have population and sample statistics, right? Just depends on what type of data we have. So, the population covariance is going to have a formula that looks like this. So, I'll kind of try to talk through this and walk through it. 
and then show you an example with some data, which I really think will help make it a little more sensitive. So you'll notice that numerator has that summation sign. So remember, a lot of times I just even shorthand it. I don't put like the I equals one to N because anytime we use the summation sign in this class, it basically just means start with the first observation, do whatever is to the right of this sign. Then do that same thing for every single observation all the way to the very last observation of the data set, right, N. Once you've done that for every observation, add them all up. So another word for this is a summation sign, right? Add up what's to the right of that, this expression for every single observation. Once we do that, simply divide by the number of observations you have in your data set capital N. Okay. So what this means is similar to the variance. Remember the variance, we took the deviation from the mean. That's all we're doing here for the X variable. We're taking every observation's value for X, subtracting the mean, the deviation of that observation from the mean. Now we're not squaring it now, right? So it matters what side of the mean I'm on, whether or not this is positive or negative. Okay. We're then going to multiply that for every observation. You know, maybe the X variable is income and the Y variable is years of education, right? So I'm now going to have two variables for every single observation, right? Every person I'm going to record their income and their years of education. I'm then going to look at the deviation of the other variable. I think the second one I said was education here, right? From the mean take each one of those deviations and multiply them by each other. I'll do that for every single person or every single observation, add them all up and divide by the number of people I have. Okay. So what is this really telling me? So I'll walk through just to think about what's gonna be going on with that numerator. So let's say I have a person, so we'll kind of call this my first observation and their income or let, I'll start out, let's say X is educate, years of education and Y is income. I'm just flipping them for a second. Let's say they have above average education. What's going to be their deviation from the education mean? If they have above average, this difference will be positive or negative? Positive. Positive, right? I'm then going to multiply that by, let's say they had above average income. Well, then this difference would be positive. So what's getting added to my numerator will be a positive value, right? This one observation was evidence that education and income tend to be on the same side of the mean, right? Well, what happens if this second person has below average education? We'd have a negative deviation from the mean, right? It'd be below. But their income is also below the average. So negative times a negative is a positive. Because that observation was also evidence that they, these two variables, education and income, tend to be on the same side of the mean. That when X is low, so is Y. Or said differently, when X is high, so is Y. Those two observations were evidence of a positive correlation, that they tend to be on the same side of the mean. Now, what would it look like if they weren't on the same side of the mean? So let's say this person had below average years of education, but I don't know, they're like Bill Gates, and they made a bunch of money, right? Because they even had dropped out. So they had above average income. Well, there we'd have a negative deviation times a positive deviation. Well, that's evidence that these two things tend to be on opposite sides of the mean, right? So we're going to go and do this for every single observation, then add them all up. So the covariance is kind of like the average measure across every observation of whether these two variables tend to be on the same side or different sides of the mean. If they're on the same side of the mean, we'll end up with a covariance that is positive over all the observations. If they tend to be on opposite sides of the mean, we'll end up with a negative covariance. So the sample formula looks the exact same. The process is the same. We use slightly different notation because we're dealing with sample means instead of population mean. And just like the variance or the covariance, we divide by n, but for a sample, we account for the fact that we only have a sample. We want to over kind of estimate what that variance might be. So we divide by n minus one. Right? Same kind of thing that we did for the variance. 
And the way that we notate these, you know, you'll notice sigma for the population covariance, S for the sample covariance. Looks kind of similar to standard deviations there. But the way that we differentiate it, it's not just sigma and F, it's we add in the subscripts of whatever two variables we're looking at the covariance between. So in this case, just X and Y, right? I'll kind of use some other examples as we progress through class today, and I'll probably write out even words here so it'll make a little more sense. So if it's positive, that tells us that as X goes up, or as X is high, Y tends to be high as well. Or if it's negative, as X is higher, Y tends to be on the other side of the mean, so Y tends to be lower. And then if it's pretty much zero, that means when X is higher, doesn't really tell us anything about Y, right? Y is just kind of around the mean all the time, no matter where X is at, right? So no relations there, okay? So let's look through another data set, put some numbers to this and kind of think about what I was getting at up here. Right? So let's say I have this huge data set, 44,000 people, I grab this data from the CDC, I've got all their heights and all their weights. Okay. So what could I say about this covariance? So I'm going to go through and start to calculate this covariance. I don't think I have. Yeah, all right. I'll walk through the steps up here on the board. <laughs> so for this first person, right, I'm giving people numbers instead of names here. Notice that, so what it should have been, this very last, it says 44,000, this is actually supposed to be the means, right? So these are the means of my two variables. Okay. I have to change that later. So I've got 63.9 or about five foot four was the average height and 187 was the average weight from this sample. For this first observation, if I'm just gonna look at this deviation from the mean, for the x variable. And then I'm going to also kind of break this down step by step, find a deviation of the mean from the y variable. And then I'm going to think about what is the product of those two things, right? Which is ultimately what I want, right? That's what was in my numerator there, right? Just breaking it down step by step so we can think about it a little bit. So for this first person, approximately, what is that deviation from the mean? So their height is 70.4. The average was what, 64-ish? So roughly, I'm going to be grossly rounding here, but right, 70 minus 64 was about a difference of six, right? Approximately a deviation of six. I'm obviously rounding the decimals way off here, but just to give an idea about kind of more of the science. What's the deviation of this first person's uh, weight from the average? Or from the mean? Roughly what? They're about 180 to 188. So roughly, they're about eight pounds below the average. So here we have an, you know, and so if we're thinking about the covariance between height and weight, before we even go through this process, what do you think is probably true about the sign of the covariance? We said the covariance is kind of the average measure of whether or not these variables tend to be on the same side of the mean. Well, if someone is above average height, probably more likely that they're also above average weight, right? I mean, a seven foot tall person would doubt is going to weigh less than 200 pounds. And if they do, they're very, very good, right? Right? So there's probably a positive correlation between height and weight, right? But for any one person, right, like this person here, well, they were above average height, but below average weight. So when we multiply those two deviations together, we get a negative value, right? So this one observation was evidence that these things tend to be on opposite sides of the mean. But that's just one out of 44,000 people, right? So we then go to the next person, right? Well, they were just barely, I mean, they're like what? Just barely below the average height, right? 63.9 is just barely below that average height of 63.97. But when we look at their weight, they were significantly below the average weight, right? So what, 135, you know, round is pretty bad, but about 50, right? You can imagine here, this ends up being a pretty small value, right? Point 0.1 of this would be five. So my guess is this is something like only adds 3.5. And I actually messed up. What did that forget to put on here? Yeah, these were both below, right? So they're actually should be negative, right? They were below the average height. Well, now 
notice, yes, this person was an observation that was evidence that these two variables tend to be on the same side of the mean. But notice if it's not very far from the mean, the value that added to that numerator was really small, 3.5. Whereas this person who was quite a bit above average height but quite a bit below average weight, they added a much larger negative value. So when I add these up, it's almost like I would need, what, 12, 13 of these people just to outweigh this one you know, this one person here. So it's not just that we're getting a sign added to that numerator, it's how far above or below the mean these observation values are. Okay? So it's kind of accounting for all of that. And then obviously we could go through the next couple of people, right? Above average height, below average weight, below average, below average. So we would just do this for every single person and add them all up, right? Then once we add them all up, divide by the number of observations we have, this should give us some average measure of kind of how far away from the mean and whether or not they lie on the same side of the mean, right? So we could do this, we end up getting 76. Well, what the hell do I do with this, right? It's positive. So it's telling me that, well, as height is higher, weight tends to be higher as well. But I can't really put a magnitude to this, right? Um, the only thing I can really do with the covariance, so let's think about why this isn't really that useful. So let's say I wanted to start to compare the relationship between multiple things, right? So maybe I've got my covariance and I've got what? Income and education. And I want to say, is the relationship between years of education and income, is that greater than or less than that relationship that exists between uh, dash, kind of height and weight there? So maybe I get that the covariance between height and weight is 76. Uh, maybe it's something like 20 for years of education and income. So, oh, well, that's less. So the relationship must not be as strong between years of education and income. Well, not quite. So the reason why we can't do this is because if I think about my units, well, to calculate my covariance, I was multiplying for height and weight inches times pounds. So my units are going to be inch pounds. First of all, I don't know what the hell that is. So I don't really know how to interpret 76 inch pounds. I don't know what that means. Um, but then think about it for income education, I would have year dollars. So my units are all screwed up, right? And if we think about this, you know, I actually chose a, a number that's probably not accurate. This is probably actually going to be a very large covariance when I'm looking at something like income, because the original variation that exists in income is way larger than the variation that exists in height and weight, right? I mean, we want to get, you know, for weight, at the most, we have a thousand pound range, right? For income, we've got a million range, right? So it's really, we can't compare across relationships. Okay? But the sign of the covariance tells us something. And we could compare the covariance, say, of height and weight in the U.S. to the covariance between height and weight in, I don't know, uh, Denmark, right? Because those are the same units, right? So if I saw a higher covariance between height and weight in Denmark, that would tell me there's a stronger relationship between height and weight in Denmark than the U.S. But that's about as far as I can go. But it'd be pretty interesting to be able to do something like this. So we're going to scale it. Right? So we're going to scale this covariance. Once we go through this process to calculate it, we're then going to scale it to get our correlation coefficient, right? And that is what becomes more interesting because then we can compare these relationships, okay? So the way that we're gonna notate this is the Greek letter rho, and then kind of R, right? Our correlation coefficient. Now we're gonna try to like trick you with between a population and sample here. In fact, the only difference is that to calculate the population co correlation, I'm using the population covariance and the population standard deviation. Calculate the sample correlation coefficient, sample covariance, and sample standard deviation. Oh, I need an eraser. We got one here. Um, so if we look at this, what's going to be true about standard deviations? I think I kind of alluded this about the variance before. But what's going to be true about the sign of the standard deviation for any variable? 
Well, you said the variance always is going to be the lowest the variance can be. No variation in our data set, not one, close. Zero, right? If every single observation was exactly the same, there'd be no deviation from the mean, right? Everything's the same. So the lowest you could see a variance would be zero. And then from there, because we squared it, we said, well, every observation then would then be either zero away from the mean or some positive value squared away from the mean. So we know that our variance is positive. If we take the square root of a positive value, we're going to end up with a, another positive value. So we know our standard deviations will always be positive. So the sign of our correlation coefficient has to be the same as the sign of our covariance. Co if we have a positive covariance, positive divided by positive is positive. If we have a negative covariance, negative divided by a positive is negative. Sign doesn't change. Right? So what this does by dividing by the standard deviation, first of all, it's going to scale our covariance to be down between one and negative one. One being the strongest positive relationship. I think I have this on this slide. So I'm saying this. There we go. One being the strongest positive relationship and negative one being the strongest negative relationship. Okay. Zero still represents no relationship, right? If we scale covariance of zero, zero divided by anything is still zero, right? So zero means no relationship. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of insight as to why in just a second, especially if you, if you like math. Not most people don't, but uh, so I'll show you. So um, it's between one and negative one. The other thing that's really nice that it does for us is remember I said like our covariance was going to be in inch pounds or inch times pounds. Well, if I have inch pounds divided by inches times pounds, I'm getting rid of my units. So by dividing by the standard deviation of each variable, I'm getting rid of my units. Now my correlation coefficient, I can compare across relationships. I can compare the relationship between height and weight the relationship between income and education. So a little bit of insight as to what this correlate, why it scales it. So I think we'll use the population one just to make it a little bit easier. So I said the numerator is just the covariance, right? So I'm gonna write that out. I'm gonna do some kind of funny math here. So don't show this to a mathematician, but I do the standard deviation for x, which is that variance, and then I take the square root, multiply that by the standard deviation for my y variable. I'm just plugging in my formulas for the standard deviations and the covariance. So the reason why this kind of can scale to be one between somewhere between one and negative one, like I said, this isn't exact mathematical proof. If you're more interested in it, you can talk to me afterwards. But notice that I've got the square root of n and the square root of n. The square root of something times the square root of something that just itself. Right? The square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is 2. Right? So you can kind of imagine I've got the square root of n times the square root of n. So I've got the denominator down here would be n, the denominator here then. These are all going to kind of cancel. From here, you can see, well, it's not exactly true, but I've got these deviations squared, and then I'm taking the square root of them. That kind of cancels out. Not perfect, not exactly, but the idea of it canceling out is okay here. Same kind of thing here. Well, you can kind of see I've got the sum of my x deviations, the sum of my deviations from y, and then I have the sum of the deviations multiplied by each other. So everything's not going to cancel to where it's always one because when you add the products, it's not the same as multiplying by the sum of each one of those deviations. But you can kind of see where there's some things that look similar so that basically your denominators are accounting for the variation that exists in the original variables themselves. The fact that income has a much wider variation just because it has a wider range of possible values than height does. So by scaling from that original the variation that exists in the data, my correlation coefficient will then be somewhere between one and negative one. Okay. You don't have to like reproduce this or really completely really understand, but that kind of gives you somewhat of an idea as to why it ends up in the scale here. So once we have that, it becomes a lot more interesting. Uh, actually, I'll hold off on this. We'll kind of go through a couple examples and then I'll return to what I was just thinking. So we go back to the CDC data. 
we can pull that covariance of 76. We could then calculate the standard deviation of each variable. You can imagine if I had an Excel file, we said what STDEV dot S for a sample. I could just select my height column, get the standard deviation pretty quick. Do the same thing and select my weight column, get that standard deviation pretty quick. Now it's just simple math. 76 divided by what? 3.16 times 43, 43.08. Now, if I get something that's outside the range of one and negative one, I know I made a mistake in my calculator here, right? If I've done this correctly, I should be getting a correlation coefficient somewhere between one and negative one. And notice the sign is always going to be the same as the sign of my covariance. Okay? So it's just scaling it. It's never going to flip the sign. It's just scaling this. Okay? So what is this kind of representing? You can think of it. It's not exactly true, um, but it's close enough to be able to say this. That the correlation coefficient is kind of telling you the slope if you drew a line that best fit a scatter plot. Remember, we talked about creating a scatter plot in Excel. I've got two variables. It kind of puts every single observation and plots it up there. Well, then I can kind of see, well, yeah, this height is a higher value. And this would be that weight goes up as well. That's not true for every observation, but across every it looks like, yeah, it's kind of this positive slope if I was going to draw a line that kind of that's with that data. Right. Any questions up to this point? No questions back here. Okay. So let's say I want to come up with a correlation coefficient here. Um, first of all, which of these answers can I rule out right away? B and B, right? B because why? My correlation coefficient has to be negative one more. 21 and negative one. That's the whole point of calculating it so that we scaled it, right, be in this range. We know it can't be D because why? It has to be the same as the sign of my covariance. So my covariance is positive. I have to have a positive correlation coefficient. I've already got a 50-50 shot if I just want to guess here. Right? Well, from here, what I do is take that covariance of 330 divided by 8.13 and 48.51. Okay? If I do that, it should get about 0.84, okay? which is a pretty high correlation, right? Um, generally, we think of correlations of 0.7 or higher as being pretty strong. Right? Sorry, I was writing that down. You're okay. You're saying that. You said, how did you use that 0.84? Yeah, so when we're talking about you same here. So my correlation and coefficient R, all I'm going to do is take that covariance and divide it by standard deviation of each variable. Right. So if I'm plugging this in here, three was it 330 divided by 8.13 times 48.51. Simple one that. Questions on that one? Okay. So if I gave you a different example, hopefully for everyone who showed up today, this one shouldn't be too bad. So let's say instead I have two different variables. This should hopefully make a little bit more sense in a second. Let's say my first variable is X, my second variable Y. So X is some measure of beauty, Y is some wage. That doesn't make a little more sense in a second why I'm giving you this example. But I look at this sample of 1,200 people. I've got my covariance here, about 0.18. I've got my standard deviations for each variable. Hopefully it should be fairly easy. I'll give you a minute or so to kind of calculate what the correlation coefficient would be here. Once again, talk to people around you. Make sure you're kind of thinking about this right. Don't make any easy mistakes here.
All right. If you haven't gotten an answer in, take your best guess here. Everybody got something in. I think I counted 20, but I could be off by one. All right, there we go. All right, I'm going to close it out. Let's see. Hopefully. All right, so why should no one have answered A? I've been putting one negative one. Remember, don't get too lost sometimes. It's easy to like finger flub on your calculator or make a really easy mistake. But if you end up with something like 1.2 here, you should have known right away I did something wrong. All right, let me try to type that in again. Okay. I also know it couldn't have been the same thing as I said before. The sign that your covariance shouldn't change when you scale it to be a correlation coefficient. Okay. So I should know that it's going to be either B or C. Right? So I'll take my covariance of 0.18. I'll then divide it by 0.68 and 4.66, just like we did over here. Right? I plug in my covariance and plug in my two standard deviations. Now, what could go wrong is if you enter this on your calculator and you just type it out like I said it, take the covariance divided by the standard deviation of X times the standard deviation of Y, well, if you hit enter in between those steps, you need to make sure that you're dividing your covariance by whatever that product is, right? So it should have kind of been finding this first, then plug it into the denominator, or making sure you're using your parentheses on the calculator, your calculator correctly. Can you do like a sample question real quick? Just want to see mm -hmm. like the difference, which is like you didn't, I did on that first one, the 330 was like, what value? Okay, so we've got our covariance there between the two variables. So that would have been the 0.18. Now they are dramatically different, but depending on the variables you have, you, you could see something very close to zero here or something even much larger than 330, right? We're dealing with. Yeah, so the nice thing is we're calculating these correlation coefficients. The sample size has already been factored into these calculations, right? My core, uh, my covariance and my standard deviations, that's where my sample size is being entered. Once I get to the point of calculating that course coefficient, my sample size is already baked in there. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Just kind of giving you that to set the example. I wasn't trying to throw anybody off there. I'm just giving you that to set the example up. Okay. You have a question in the group I I think this is really low. Yeah, 0 0.06. So if I'm looking at this, I could say that the relationship, well, if I go back to this one, the relationship between height and weight was what, 0.84? The relationship between all this beauty, wages, 0 0.06, and I'll give you another one. Let's say we had uh, hours of Netflix watch and exam scores. What do you think is probably true about the sign of that correlation? The more hours of Netflix you watch, the worse you do on the exam. Right. We're thinking about the same. So here's my three different relationships. I can actually compare across relationships to that correlation coefficient. Which of these has the strongest relationship? This is a stick, sorry. I said, what height weight? Height weight, right? The closer we get to one or the closer you get to negative one, the stronger the relationship. So if I'm ranking these, this is definitely the strongest relationship, that relationship. What's the next strongest? Yeah. Well, why isn't it just the next? lowest values, this is negative, because the strength of the relationship, right, is just how close you're getting to one or negative one, right? The sign is telling you the relationship is moving in a different direction. So the next strongest relationship would actually be between hours of Netflix watching your exam score. So when you're comparing the strength of relationships, you're essentially ignoring the negative sign, right? Or kind of what we say is taking the absolute value. Taking the absolute value just drop that negative sign. And then the weakest relationship here is between kind of looks and wages. Any questions on this before you move in? Everyone else? This is not a primary example. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe I do. I do Kyler Murray's screaming hours and passing yards down there. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we can compare any. We can just look at it. You know, we have the observations. We can compute these correlation coefficients for any two variables that we're interested. Um, I use this example. It's not so. I think at the end of class, I'll show this to you. Um, I don't want to waste too much of your time. I know we're doing it later, but it's Monday, it's early in the week. This is a Comedy Central sketch. It's pretty funny, but it's related to this idea of uh, beauty and wages. So this economist actually did this study. Uh, this is why I pulled that survey. They like 1,200 people. This is actually really genius. So they had all these photos, right? And I think, um, I forget how many of couple hundred or something, and they gave it to these 1,200 people, and they had them rank the photos on a slate scale from zero to 100. Right? They then looked at the average score of every photo, right, in terms of attractiveness. They then put these people into what percentile that photo landed in. Okay? So they had some outside parties rank these photos. They now put the photos kind of in order, right? What percentile every single photo was in, in terms of attractiveness to the general public? So these were completely made up people. I mean, these were real photos. What they then did is use those photos for LinkedIn profiles, created the exact same resume for every single one of those profiles, and sent them out to different companies applying for jobs. So you have identical people on paper, but just different photos on their LinkedIn profile. And what they found was the number of interview requests as the attractiveness percentile of that LinkedIn profile went up, actually led to a slightly higher number of interview requests for males. Where you can kind of see here for the female data, we had this significant. Right? Now, to me, this is an alarming thing, right? <laughs> it shouldn't matter at all what your LinkedIn profile looks like, whether or not you're getting interview request, requests, especially when your resume is exactly the same. If I didn't see the same resume, and I see somebody who like, looks very disheveled in the photo, that's one thing, right? But if we're just talking about attractiveness percentile on a LinkedIn professional photo, with the exact same resume, a positive correlation here is very alarming. Right? So these correlations often kind of allow us to identify problem areas or maybe when things are going well, I guess, right? If we had instead uh, the person's like SAT score and the number of admissions they got in the college. So like, well, we want to see a positive correlation between those two things, right? Um, and actually, by the end of the course, we'll talk about taking it one step further going something even better than these correlations that tell us about a causal relationship. So right now we're just saying the correlation. Could be the whole uh, ice cream sales and drowning deaths example I gave you like on day one. All right, so we will spend a little bit of time today on probability, uh, kind of leading us in the next topic. So I will probably put up the next smart, uh, smart book uh, up on Canvas, if you want to take a look at it before we start class on Wednesday, it may give you just some prep, you know, some eyes on some things that we're going to talk about, maybe making it a little bit easier to follow along in class, or just give you some terminology to make it easier as I'm, I'm working through it. So you'll see that pop up on Canvas. Smart books, always worth zero points, just some additional practice. So, you know, when we talk about probability, you know, I think we use this in everyday language, right, a lot. So what are the chances that sales decrease if I change the price? Uh, what are the odds that a new investment becomes profitable? What's the likelihood this new assembly method increases production? I mean, or productivity, sorry. All these words, likelihood, odds, chances, they're all getting at the same idea. Something is occurring. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. When we change the price, we don't know the exact outcome on sales, right? But we want to know well, what are the chances that sales go up by 10%, what are the chances it goes up by 20, right? There's all these different possible outcomes. And some of them are more likely than others, right? If I increase the price, you know, I doubt that I'm going to see sales probably, you know, increase with that. Right? The higher, the higher everybody is the price, usually people buy less. So we're trying to get at we have all these outcomes, and we know some of them are more likely to occur than others. Okay. I think I had another class that I was giving the example of, you know, if I choose someone at random, what's the probability that they're, I don't know, five foot eight? Oh, relatively high. It's pretty kind of common height. What's the problem if I select someone at random? They're over seven foot two, almost zero, right? So I know there's all these possible outcomes I could see when I select that person at random, but every single value 
has a different likelihood or different probability of occurring. So we'll kind of have this set up and we'll talk a little bit more specific about probabilities. But the idea is going to be, we're going to run some experiment. Now these, don't think about physics or whatever. Don't think about the hard science here. Uh, experiment could be as simple as selecting a person at random and recording their height or asking them what their favorite type of food is, right? So we can run these experiments, right? And we just know that there's all these possible outcomes we just don't know what the outcome can be. When I select a person at random, I know the range of possible height. I don't know what their actual height is going to be. Excuse me. So I'm going to repeat this experiment over and over and over again in the exact same way, or I'm just going to select a different person at random over and over and over and over again. Right? I'm going to record kind of whatever this variable is, all the different outcomes I see. So experimental, the experimental outcomes. Sometimes I know these ahead of time, sometimes I don't. So if I knew the experimental outcomes ahead of time, this would be something like if I'm drawing a card from a deck, I know, unless it's you know, it's a regular 52 card playing deck, I can see ace through king, or ace two, three, all the way up through king. Now, those are the possible outcomes I could see if I chose a card at random. Now, I don't know which card I'm going to get, but I know it's going to be one of those. Now, the sample space. Maybe I'll use the card example. You know, um, hopefully no one knows. Well, it's a fun game. Hopefully someone knows what I'm talking about. Have you ever heard of a Rook deck? The card game Rook? Okay. So it's kind of like, uh, we're in the Midwest. Anybody know Euchre? Oh, yeah. It's kind of like Euchre, but it's more complicated. <laughs> um, so anyway, so you have no idea what a Rook deck is. You don't even know if they're numbered cards when I'm telling you this. So I've got a Rook deck here. And I say, take a card at random. You pull it out. And you see, you know, a 10. Oh, okay, well, I know there's at least a 10 in this deck. You write that outcome down. Shuffle them, have someone pull them. Oh, I got the rook card. Well, now you know that there's this weird rook card in this deck. So you write that down. But if you only get to draw two cards, your sample space is only what you see. So in that situation, I don't really know the possible experimental outcomes I can see because I only got to draw two cards. I only know two of the possible outcomes I, I can see because that's all that was in my sample space. Now, a lot of the times, we can just keep running this experiment over and over, so we're kind of guaranteed to eventually know what all the experimental outcomes are. You can imagine, you know, even if I draw, you know, it could be luck of the draw, I take 100 cards out, I might miss one of the possible cards that's in that deck, just by sheer luck. Right? So, experimental outcomes is a larger space than our sample space sometimes. Then from there, we might be interested in a specific event. So, if I'm thinking about a regular deck of cards, my event that I'm interested in could just be, well, what's, you know, if I draw a card random, I just want to know what's the probability I see a face card, right? I see, you know, Jack Queen, King of Kings, I think it's call Ace for a face card. All right, so it's kind of a small subset of whatever I see in my sample space. Right? So kind of a nice visual. Here's all my possible experimental outcomes. Usually my sample space is pretty much the same as my experimental outcomes, but if I don't get to run the experiment a lot of times, my sample space might be a little bit smaller. And then the event that we're interested in is always going to be a smaller subset of either my sample space or my possible experimental outcomes that I can see. So think of some other easy examples here. If I flip a coin, these are ones we should all know. What are the possible outcomes of that experiment with the regular coin? Heads or tails. Heads or tails, right? I guess if you want to be obnoxious, it could land straight on out in the middle, right? But heads or tails, right? What if I roll a die? Yeah, unless I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons, right? It's one through six. Okay. So, what if I want to choose a card from deck? I can already gave this one. I don't care about suit, ace of king. If I wanted to break this down by suit, I would have, you know, every single possible card there, right? Every single ace, every single king. What if I play, yeah, I need to throw a caveat on this one because I know my thought process here. Uh, what about a playoff football game? Win or lose? And each one has a 50% chance, because I don't know anything else, 50% chance. Right? What about a soccer game during the season? A lot more likely win, lose, draw. Yeah, draw. Okay. So these are all, you know, you can see experiments can be anything. Right? And like I already mentioned, it can also just be survey questions, right? Asking somebody a question, right? What's your favorite type of food, you know, et cetera. So the way that we're going to write these probabilities, is we have all these possible experimental outcomes, and we know that some values or some outcomes are more likely than others. 
So we're going to have the probability of an event, right? Is just the sum of the probabilities of every outcome in that event. So this could be an easy one. If I'm rolling a dice, what's the probability I roll a one? Six <clears throat> different values. One six. They're all equally as like, unless I like have a cheater's dice. So one six. Well, what's the probability that I get either a one or a two? One, two. One six plus one six, right? I'm just adding up, summing up the probabilities of every outcome in that event. Okay. So you know, the event doesn't just have to be one outcome; it can be several. And if the event is several outcomes, we're just adding up the probability of each one of those outcomes in the event. So the way we'll write this is P, and then in parentheses, whatever the event we're interested in. So the probability of this event. Um, or so if we look think about any one outcome, what's the lowest probability that, that could occur? So that's not the lowest probability. Zero is the lowest, right? So if I tell you I'm rolling a regular six-sided dice, what's the probability I roll a 10? Can't, right? So there that probability would be zero. You can think of probabilities are like percentages in decimal form, right? We move the decimal two places. So 0% chance, probability would be zero. But let's say I had a 1% chance, probability would be 0 0.01. Okay. So it's just moving that decimal point two places or kind of our percentages in decimal form. So what's the highest probability you could ever see occur? Mm -hmm. One. One, right? A hundred percent chance of something occurring would be a probability of one. If I move that decimal two places to the left. So I know that my probability is somewhere between zero and one of any event that I'm interested in, right? We can't go outside of that. Okay? Even if I think about an event, let's say I say, what's the probability that I roll a one, two, three, four, five, or a six? Well, <laughs> I'm guaranteed to roll one of those numbers. Right? So the probability there would just be one sixth plus one sixth plus one sixth plus one sixth plus one sixth, plus one sixth which would add up to one. Right? It's the highest probability I can see. Okay. Now, if I take every possible outcome, similar like I just did with a dice example, what should the probabilities of every possible outcome always add up to? Just like the dice example, one. I've covered every possible outcome, nothing else can occur. So when I added the probability of every possible outcome that I could see, it should add up to one. This starts to look kind of similar to something we've already done. This ring the bell at all? Going back a little ways. But when we calculated relative frequencies, we said the lowest they could be is zero, highest they could be is one. And when we added up all those relative frequencies, they've always added up to one. Okay. Same kind of idea, right? If I think about like the, um, Histogram example, when we turn them into relative frequencies. Well, if I'm thinking about income, I'll give you a two-bin example to make it easy. If I take the probability makes someone, someone makes between zero and $50,000, and then I add that to the probability they make between 50 or 50,000 or above, well, that's every possible income value that has to add up to one, right? Now, obviously, usually we have it broken down into much like finer kind of bins there, but that's the general idea, okay? It's just now we're thinking about the probably get a one plus the probably get a two plus probably get a three up to six for that, for that dice again. Any questions? This one should be too bad. So we're gonna we're gonna assign these probabilities in a couple different ways. Probably go this through this kind of quick because it's not overly interesting. I'm not gonna like really ask you a ton of questions on the homework or the exam. So the easiest way that we assign these probabilities is the classical method. Right? So this is really only applicable if I have outcomes that are equally as likely. So my dice example, I said there's six numbers on this dice. They're all equally as likely. So my probability of getting any one number was one sixth. If I flip a coin, what's the probability to see heads and the probability to see tails? Equal as likely outcomes, one half or 0.5. So all I'm doing there, what if I had 100 possible outcomes and they're all equally as likely? The probability of seeing any one of those values would be so if I took 100 pieces of paper and wrote one on one, two on the other, three all the way up to 100, put them in a hat, pulled one out, what's the probability I get a 50? One out of 100. How are you doing that? 
You're really just doing one out of the possible total possible number of outcomes. So usually this is the number of observations. Here I'm kind of thinking about n being the number of possible outcomes there. So classical method is pretty easy. The empirical method is probably more practical. We'll talk a little bit about this in a second. I've got slides for each one of these. And then the subjective method is kind of a unique one. Not very often will we use it, but it has its place, right? So let's think about another example of this classical method. Let's say I'm flipping a coin twice. So I've got four different possible outcomes, right? I get two heads, I get a heads first, then tails, a tails first, then a head, with two tails. We've got four possible combinations. What's the probability? Let's say I get two tails here. There's four possible outcomes. So the probability of any one outcome should just be one over the number of possible outcomes, right? Just like when I flip a coin, I can only see heads or tails. There's two outcomes. The probability of each one is one half. I've got a hundred numbers. The probability of any one number is one over a hundred. If I have four possible outcomes, the probability of any one outcome would be one over 40 or 0.25. Any questions here? And not to be honest, these are usually toy examples where you get to use the classical method. In practice, it's going to be something more like this, right? This is just a goofy example, but let's say I'm asking people, you know, asking students around campus what their favorite type of cuisine is. So, you know, they could say Mexican food, Greek food, Italian, whatever, right? So I take a small sample, I have 60 students, and I record all their responses. And I said 15 of them chose Mexican food as their favorite. So I then think, okay, I'm going to choose another person at random. What's the probability that they respond with Mexican food as their favorite? Well, based off of historical data that I have, 15 out of the 60 observations I had responded with this outcome of that Mexican food is their favorite. So this new person I'm asking at random, the probability they respond with that as well, should be 15 out of 60 or 0.25 or 25%. So it's basically you run this experiment, you ask a random person over and over, or a random student here, you record all the data, then based off of all that recorded data, you assign the probabilities that way. This is generally how we come up with probabilities, like 90 plus percent of the time probably. Questions here? Shouldn't be too bad. And I think, um, I don't know if we'll get completely through the example on Wednesday, but for sure on next Monday, we'll finish it. We'll start working with some Excel data and I'll kind of show you how like we're, we would come up with these probabilities. Like we just have this huge data set with all these responses. Excuse me. The last one seems like it makes no sense at first. Hopefully after the example, I give you a will. So the subjective method is you just, based off my knowledge, uh, I assign the probabilities how I believe they should be. Well, that sounds pretty... Yes, right. But you can imagine a situation like a company is going to choose a CEO. There's four candidates. Well, should I use the classical method? They're all equally as likely. Each candidate has a 0.25 probability of, of getting the job. Well, what if Andy's like been the CEO of 10 different companies and all went bankrupt? And Rankin is like, uh, took a company from like the ground floor, getting it up into like the S&P 500. <laughs> Well, I, I know that he probably has a much higher likelihood of getting the job, a much higher probability of getting the CEO job. So the classical method doesn't make any sense. But does the empirical method make sense? Well, I could get close to this experiment, but I can't actually run this experiment over and over. Like I can't have the same four candidates applying for the same job and have the company choose one and the same four candidates apply again and choose that. Like that's not a realistic thing to do. So all I can do is look at their resumes and based off my industry knowledge, maybe consult some other you know, industry experts, come up with what I believe the probabilities of each candidate. Any questions on this? But usually we'll use the empirical method. So welcome to probability statistics, the class where everything's made up and numbers don't matter. I'm just subjectively assigning probabilities. And if you guys don't know what this reference, you should all YouTube whose lines anyways. Great old show. Like the show. I mean, they can't get away with it now. Um, but it's hilarious. Also, I saw that they're doing like uh I don't think it was college tours, like really small town tours. Like they would come to like Muncie, and it's like one of the original cast members, nobody else is the same. I doubt it's still as good when they do that, but the old the old clips are good. Anyways, 
I digress. So we got a little bit of time here. I want to hit um, some basic notation, maybe kind of show you some visuals to think about probabilities, and then we'll kind of end with that, uh, what I think is somewhat of a, a funny story. clip here. Yeah. So some basic notation when we're coming up with probabilities. Okay. So the first is going to be, we're going to talk about something called complements. Okay. So I'm going to walk through something using set theory. It's just a way of me showing you what's in these events. It's really the only day I'll use it. And I think it'll help give you a good visualization of what I'm talking about here. Um, and I'll, I'll be slow and deliberate with it. So let's say I'm just using these to say like the outcomes that are in event A. That's all this means, okay? So let's say I'm rolling a dice, right? Six-sided dice, and I want event A to be the outcomes of one, two, or three. Those are all the outcomes that are in my event A. Okay. For future, I'm going to also have event B, and that's just outcomes two, four, six. Okay. You get what I'm saying here? If these are the, the three numbers I could see that would, you know, we're rolling a dice that would be in set A. If I see one of these three numbers, we would say those outcomes are in event B. So if I want the complement of A, in mathematics, when we say something complements each other, it means basically everything that's not in A. Okay. A complement, the easiest way to think about it is everything, every outcome that's not in event A. So here, what would A complement be? I'm just rolling a six, yeah. I'm rolling a six sided dice, four, five, and six. It's the only other possible outcomes I could see. What if I wanted just to kind of complete here? What if I wanted B complement? Yeah, what well, outcomes are not in B? One, three, and five. Okay. Any questions on this? Is this making sense? So the complement just means every event that's not in whatever event you're looking at, right? A complement, every event, not in it. What if I wanted the union of two events, okay? So when we talk about, did I do unions first? Yeah, I did. When I talk about unions, I can think about reading this as A union B. It's just this set symbol. It looks like a U, so that's kind of easy, right? A union B, or the way that we usually say it in English, A or B. Right? Is the outcome in A or B, right? In event A or in event B. So here, if I wanted the union, all the outcomes that are in event A or in event B, what would those outcomes be? Well, I could see a one. I could see a two. Now we don't double count it because two is just one out, like it's it's an outcome, right? I see a two roll. All right. The next outcome I can see that's in either one of these is three, four, and then six, right? These are all the possible outcomes that are either in A or they're in B. They can be in both, but they have to be in, you know, in at least one of them. Okay. Any questions there? Not too bad yet, I don't think. Next one is what we kind of think about as A intersection with B or A and B, right? So some people say, you know, remember this one, the U is the union, right? A or B. And then some people say like for the intersection, A and B, you put a line through it, it looks like an A. I don't know if that helps you remember it at all, but that is a trick I've heard people kind of use to remember that this means A and B, okay? But in reality, it's just an upside down set symbol, which kind of represents the intersection of these two events. Okay. So what would the intersection of A and B be here? The only outcome that's in both of these is two. Okay. Pretty easy. I mean, this is an easy example. So, but but that's the idea. Okay. Now I have one more. Um, I'm gonna kind of punt on it. For a second, I'll just show you the notation and tell you how we read it. We'll return, we'll revisit this on Wednesday. But 
this is what we would say is a conditional. And the way we read it is A given B. So what this is telling us is what, whatever's on the right-hand side of this vertical line, we're saying this event has occurred. So given that B has occurred, given that this event on the right has occurred, now what's the probability that we see A, see A occur? So remember, all of this we're setting up. I'm just using this like we're not doing probabilities yet. Eventually, we're going to want like the probability of A complement, the probability of the union, right? Just hopefully giving us a way to think about the union intersection and complement here before we get the probabilities. So the way I would kind of at least set this up to make some sense, think about event A is that I slip and fall walking out of my car, right, in the parking lot. That probability of event A occurring is pretty pretty low. I'm clumsy, but not, not that bad, right? Now, if you tell me, well, what's the probability I slip and fall getting out of my car given that there was freezing rain the past hour? Probably a lot higher. Right, so you can kind of imagine these conditional probabilities matter because once we're given another piece of information, that probability of seeing a certain event occur could change based off of that knowledge. Right, I always use the example. I will start using this example, and somebody will be like, uh, you know, if someone is either Republican or Democrat, that would change the probability of certain stances on political issues. Right, so what's the probability if I select someone at random? If they're in favor, uh, you know, support legalization of marijuana. Well, that's going to change a lot if you tell me, okay, well, what's the probability they support legalization of marijuana, marijuana given they're Republican? Probably makes you think probably is going to get a little lower, just based off of as a whole, right, on the average. Okay. So you can go through, um, we'll go through some more examples of this, but I'm just kind of introducing it here. Okay. So the nice visualization of these things, right? We'll start using some Venn diagrams just to help give us a visual so we don't get too lost in the numbers once we get to table. So we're going to represent, whenever I draw these Venn diagrams, this entire rectangle is the every, it represents every possible experimental outcome. So if we're going to start thinking about probabilities in terms of these Venn diagrams, every possible outcome, if I took the probability of every possible outcome, that should add up to, what did I say earlier? Yeah, one. So that rectangle, you can kind of think about as the entire space of that rectangle is one. Okay. Right, that represents the probability of every possible outcome, which should add up to one. We'll then start drawing our events. So here is event A. So that circle represents the probability of A. Circle B represents the probability of B. What about the outcomes that are in event B, but also in event A? Well, that would be every outcome that's in A and B, right? So that overlap of those two events, right? This represents my intersection. And then what does the union look like? Well, that means I'm in either, either A or in B. So I could be in event A, but outside of B. I could be in event B, but outside of A. Or I could be in both, right? So the union is just the entire area, right? The entire space of both event A and B. So I think this will help when we start talking through some things that kind of have a visual to go along with it. Um, but for now, right, it's not, not too bad yet. Okay. So we will also start using contingency tables. So where are we at in time? Okay. We'll do a little bit more today and we'll kind of pick up on this next class. So the way that we read these tables are the total columns represent the probability of the events themselves. So we'll start giving these names when we work through examples to make it more interesting, but, but for now, whatever our event A is, the probability of A is 0.6. Now we go over to this total column. And next class, I'll tell you why, but one way you can reproduce these totals is to add across the rows. Actually, I might give you a little bit of going series a second, just so you don't have to hopefully forget about that. But I then, if I want the total of the probability of B, I go down to the total here, or I can add down the columns, right? 0.4 plus 0.1 is 0.5, just like 0.4 plus 0.2 gave us that 0.6, right? So the totals represent the probability of the events themselves. And then the top four left cells all represent intersections of whatever the row and column heading are. So this cell here is the probability of A and B occurring. This cell here is the probability that A complement 
and B complement occurs. So those top four left cells represent intersections, the total columns kind of represent the probability of the events themselves. Now I'm telling you, you can come up with these total columns by adding down the rows or across the columns. So that's the last thing that we'll do before I show you that quick clip. So let's say I've got event A here. I need some colors to help make this a little easier. So I've got my event A. I then have event B. And then here, I'll shade in. If I shaded all that in, what is that? Really? That's everything that's not in B. So B complement. So let's think about it this way. This kind of area right here is every outcome that's in circle A and not in B, right? Or it's in B complement. So this black shaded area would be like the probability of A and not being in B, right? Or B complement. What is this? What is this area? These were all the outcomes that were both in A and in B. So the probability of A and B. Well, notice if I add these two together, I'm left with the entire circle of A. Right? So if I want the probability of A, I can add the probability of A and B to the probability of A and B complement. And that's why. If I add across the rows, I can reproduce those colors or the, the visualization that supports that. Okay. Questions on on that? All right. So we'll pick up on that next class. So going back to our correlation talk earlier, kind of end on this. Hopefully, bring a smile to your face after having to sit through. An hour and 10 minutes of stats discussion, right? And I'll probably have to run an ad here, so I'll change this.